All right, class. So welcome. Happy Monday. Here we are the last day of February, I think, February 28th. Um, I'm just pulling up our schedule for you so you can kind of see where we're at. Um, these next couple of chapters are kind of heavy. So we only get one day, for example, to get through the muscular system and nervous system, but it's going to take us at least two days to get through all those. So this lecture exam that you see here um, is going to be pushed back a little bit. Um, so today we'll try to finish our chapter seven, muscular system, and then we'll start chapter eight, nervous system. Um, but just keep that in mind as you're looking ahead to your next exams. What you can probably count on is for lab, we always stay on track in the syllabus for lab. So today in lab, if you have Monday's lab, we'll go over your muscle system and then you have a muscular system scavenger hunt. So we will stay on schedule for lab. So your next lab practical will be um, cor correct, but this next lecture exam will be pushed back a little bit because as you'll see, we have a lot of information to get through. Um, so we'll start, we'll continue finishing up chapter seven on muscle system, and then we'll start chapter eight. So let's go to chapter seven. Um, we ended here on muscle tone. And kind of the remainder of the chapter takes us through muscle tone as well as the other different types of muscle. And then the rest of the chapter goes through just the different types of muscles in the body, which we spend a lot of time in lab doing as well. Okay, so muscle tone, it's the constant tension produced by your body muscle over a longer period of time. And we need muscle tone, for example, to always keep our back upright, to keep our legs straight when we're standing, to keep our head in an upright position, as well as our abdomen from bulging out. Otherwise, your abdomen would just continue to bulge out. And muscle tone depends on a very small percentage of all the motor units in a muscle being stimulated at any point in time, causing their muscle fibers to contract, but they would be out of phase with one another. So that in general, somewhere in your muscle is keeping up the muscle tone. We're focusing on skeletal muscle, but smooth muscle, remember we have three types of muscle in the body. Smooth muscle cells are non-striated. They're small spindle-shaped muscle cells. They're usually with one nucleus per cell. The myofile filaments are not organized into sarcomeres, so they don't look striated. And the cells comprise, these cells comprise um, organs controlled involuntarily, except your heart. So all your organs, like your stomach, your digestive tract, your intestines, anything, any organ that's controlled involuntarily, except the heart is most likely made up of smooth muscle. And neurotransmitter substances, hormones, and other substances can stimulate smooth muscle as well. Cardiac muscle cells are long, they are striated, they branch, and they usually have one nucleus per cell. And they are striated because their sarcomeres are arranged with myofilaments. And cardiac muscle contraction is what we call autorhythmic. And that is important to know because autorhythmicity just means that your cardiac muscle tissue has the ability to establish its own heartbeat. So if we were to remove a heart from a body, it would continue beating for a while, not for very long because it doesn't have blood supply. Um, but that's what we mean when they, we say autorhythmic, it establishes its own heartbeat. Cardiac muscle cells are also special in that they're connected to one another um, via desmosomes and gap junctions called special intercalated discs. And this, these intercalated discs allow your cardiac muscle cells to communicate and action potentials to stimulate adjacent cells because ions can travel through these intercalated discs. And then we'll get into skeletal muscle and the different types of skeletal muscles we have. And again, you'll spend a lot of time in lab re reviewing these. Um, you have over 700 types of skeletal muscles. So we're not going to learn all of them. And when we say, you know, 700 skeletal muscles, many of them are just mirror images of each other. So for example, you have a rectus, a quadricep group on the left leg and a quadricep group on the right leg. So that makes up eight muscles right there. So here, front and back skeletal muscles. Um, again, we go over these in lab, but you'll just have to spend some time studying these. We'll talk about how muscle, the kind of the anatomy behind these muscles, and that'll help you with naming, as well as how generally structured muscles are and how the naming of skeletal muscles will be based on how their fascicles or fibers are arranged. 
So the first kind of thing we will talk about is a tendon, and that connects the skeletal muscle to the bone. And aponeurosis, if you see anything labeled that, that's a broad sheet-like tendon. And a retinaculum is a band of connective tissue that holds down the tendons at each wrist and at each ankle. Your skeletal muscles will attach with an origin and insertion, and the origin part of a skeletal muscle will be the attachment at the least mobile, mobile location, and the insertion part of the muscle is the end of the muscle attached to the bone undergoing the greatest movement. And I'll show you a picture of this in the slide. The part of the muscle between the origin and insertion is called the belly. And if you have a group of muscles that work together, which many of your muscles do, they perform the same action in your body, we call them agonists. And if you have a muscle or a group of muscles that oppose each other or their actions are opposite, we call them antagonists. So here we have a muscle attachment. Here's the origin of your biceps brachii, for example. It's at the least movable part of the muscle. And then the insertion, for example, it inserts itself on the radial tuberosity of your radius bone. That's the most mo mobile part of the muscle. So we call that the insertion. And um, when your biceps flex, they'll pull up your radius to do the flexion of your arm. Um, the biceps itself, you can see here, um, the triceps is behind it on the posterior side of the uh, upper arm. The biceps and the triceps are antagonists because their option, actions are opposite. So your biceps help you to flex your forearm and triceps will help you to extend or straighten your arm. Um, so the biceps and the triceps will be antagonists because their actions are opposite. How else can we help you when we're figuring out where these muscles are located? How do we name muscles? Muscles are always named according to where they're located. We talked a little bit about body regions at the way beginning of the semester. Well, you might see some of those body region names come up again when we describe muscles. So the pectoralis muscle is located in the chest. The size of the muscle, many times um, the naming of the muscle will be longus or brevis, meaning long or short. Uh, the shape of the muscle, the shape of the muscle might kind of sneak into its name as well. Um, the deltoid muscle, triangular, quadrate, rectangular, round. So you might see the shape of the muscle sneak into its name. And the orientation of fascicles, um, fascicles can run straight and we call that a rectus muscle or at an angle and we call that an oblique muscle or they might run in an orbit or a circle and we call that um, an orbicularis muscle. Origin and insertion, for example, the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, the name of that muscle tells you exactly its origin and insertions. Its origin is on the sternum and the clavicle, sternocleido, and the insertion is on the mastoid process. So the name of that muscle actually tells you exactly where it's located. If you can remember some of where your sternum is, your clavicle, and where your mastoid is, you know that your sternocleidoid mastoid will go between the two. Uh, the number of heads, for example, your biceps and triceps. Um, the biceps has two heads and triceps has three heads. And then the function. Many times your muscles will be named for their function. So especially in your leg, you have abductors and adductor muscles, and they cause your legs to abduct or go out or adduct and come back in. So the nomenclature behind some of these muscles, many students find learning muscle names is easier because you've already learned a lot of the bone names and you've already learned a lot of the body regions. So if you can kind of can combine that and you're getting into this language of anatomy, um, learning muscle names and where they're located is a little easier. So muscles of mastication, and I'm gonna go through these next um, slides relatively quickly because it's pretty much just identifying, and this is exactly what you'll spend three hours in lab practicing as well. Um, but these are the muscles that help you chew, the temporalis, the masseter, and the pterygoids. The P is silent. Uh, here are the muscles of mastication. Here's the masseter muscle. I'm just gonna kind of color over it. Um, you can't really see your pterygoids from here, and I think uh, the temporalis is shown up here. So if you, the next time you chew your meal, put your um, hands on your side of your heads and you'll feel your temporalis will be as well. 
The pterygoid muscles are more deep within the cheek, and we can't see those right here, but I think they won't show yet. Here are tongues, the tongue and your swallowing muscles. Um, many of them will have either a pharyngeal name to it because the pharynx is where you're swallowing. So a middle, an inferior pharyngeal um, constrictor. You also have muscles that say suprahyoid, um, which are muscles above the hyoid bone. So these are all muscles that are kind of controlling the tongue and how you swallow food as it goes down your esophagus. Um, infrahyoid muscle is inferior or below the hyoid bone. The deep neck and back muscles, we call the all your um, kind of back muscles the erector spiny muscles because they help your spine stay erect. And you can see here that we kind of have parallel muscles running along each side of the spine, um, longissimus, iliocostalis, uh, spinalis, and you can see the long, longissimus kind of sneaking through as it comes down the entire length of the spine and then the iliocostalis. So these muscles are very important for keeping your neck and your back upright. We talked about muscle tone, and these are some of the muscles that are constantly contracting and maintaining a little bit of muscle tone um, to keep yourself upright. The thoracic muscles are all involved with breathing and intercostal muscles are between ribs. Inter means between and costal has to do with ribs. And you have two layers, the external and internal, and they kind of lie on top of each other. And their striations go the same way as if you were to kind of put your hands in your pockets. Those are the way the striations would go. Um, and how I remember what their action is, is the external intercostals help with inspiration. So they elevate your ribs, so they'll make your rib cage larger as you inspire or breathe in. And internal intercostals depress the ribs as you expire or exhale. Um, and the diaphragm is constantly moving. It's your most important muscle for breathing, um, especially just during natural, quiet breathing. Your diaphragm is always moving. So here are the muscles of the thorax. You can see that the uh, internal and external intercostals lie between the rib cage to expand or depress the rib cage as you breathe in or breathe out. And then the diaphragm, it's kind of this dome shaped, shaped muscle shown here. Um, when you expire, so when you breathe out, your diaphragm takes on this dome shaped structure. And then as you inhale, the diaphragm becomes flat because it needs to make space for your rib cage to expand. So those are your muscles for breathing, muscles of the thorax. Abdominal wall muscles, the rectus abdominis is at the center of your abdomen. This is your six pack. Um, it compresses your abdomen as if you're doing a sit up. And then you have three layers of kind of lateral oblique muscles. The external abdominal oblique is the side of the abdomen. The internal abdominal oblique is the layer underneath, and you have a transversus abdominis, which is your third kind of lateral oblique muscle. And you can see these shown here. Your rectus abdominis is your kind of your six pack, you could say. It's rectus because it's straight, remember? You can kind of see how it goes um, on either side and it's connected. So you kind of have two sets of rectus abdominis muscles and they're connected by this area called the linea alba, which connects them together. And there's your little umbilicus belly button. And then you three, see your three layers of lateral oblique muscles. The external oblique is the later, lateral most or the exterior. And then if we cut that back, you can see the internal oblique as kind of the second layer underneath. And the transversus abdominis is the third innermost um, oblique abdominal layer. Uh, the trapezius muscle extends your neck and head. It makes up your shoulders, your upper back, and then your pectoralis major is in your chest, which helps you to elevate your ribs. The serratus anterior is between the ribs to help elevate them. And the deltoid is your shoulder muscle to help you abduct or move your arm away. More upper limb muscles, the triceps extends your elbow. It's on the posterior side of your arm and the biceps is on the anterior side of the arm to help flex the muscle. The brachialis also helps to flex your elbow. So we talked about muscle groups that were agonists, that they work together. 
your biceps and your brachialis muscle are agonists because their action is the same, both to flex your elbow and then your latissimus dorsi makes up your lower back to help extend your shoulder. So here are some of the arm muscles. You have a nice kind of triangular shaped deltoid muscle around your shoulder. You can see the posterior triceps and the anterior biceps with the brachialis kind of, kind of right underneath your biceps. The brachioradialis also helps to flex your arm, but it will continue into kind of the lower forearm region of your arm as well. Here we have the pectoralis major muscle on the chest with the serratus anterior also helping kind of elevate your ribs during inhale. You can see that the serratus anterior looks like kind of the serrated edge of a knife, um, this kind of jagged edge, if that helps you remember that. And um, we don't have a good view of your trapezius and latissimus dorsi yet, but we will see that better in lab. Um, forearm muscles, we have lots of muscles in your forearm, and that is because um, many of the muscles in your forearm have tendons that go to control movement of your fingers. So you might have two muscles with two tendons just to control the movement of your thumbs. So we have a lot of movement precision in controlling our thumbs. And because of that, we have a ton of forearm muscles. Many of the muscles on the, um, the front side of the forearm, so your palm side, will have the word flexor in them. And that's because these muscles on the palm side, the front side of your forearm will help you flex or bend your wrist as a flexion action. Um, and then they'll either say radialis if it's on the radial side, ulnaris if it's on your pinky side. Uh, there will be a digitorum profundus, kind of a deeper muscle that goes to the digits of your fingers or superficialis, more superficial. You'll have a pronator muscle that helps you to do the action of pronation and then brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis brevis. So many of these will be have flexor names. The extensor carpi radialis brevis um, will work with extension. So here are muscles on the anterior view, many of them having the word flexor in them. Um, if you have an ulnaris muscle, it will be on the pinky side or ulna side of the forearm and a radialis muscle will be on the radius or thumb side. We can see here from the posterior view, the retinaculum is that piece of connective tissue that holds all the tendons in place um, of the wrist. And there's one nerve that goes through that retinaculum. It's also called the carpal tunnel. And that is the median nerve. And when the median nerve gets squished or pinched, usually from doing too much of this action when you're typing, um, you can cause the carpal tunnel syndrome and that can be painful. On the posterior view of the forearm, and again, we go over this in greater detail in lab, you'll see today, we have many muscles with the word extensor in them because the muscles on the posterior side of the forearm will help to extend or kind of straighten your wrist back. So again, if you have an ulnaris extensor muscle, that'll be more on the pinky side. Um, a radialis muscle, an extensor muscle, will be on the thumb or radial side. Pelvic floor muscles. So these are all muscles that make up the pelvic floor. And um, these, the next picture I show you will be a little graphic because I'm going to show you the pelvic floor. They're, they're kind of similar, but a little different between males and females. And they're arranged into triangles, whether they surround the urethra where urine comes out or the anal triangle. So they're kind of arranged similarly, but they're a little different based on the differences in anatomy. Um, we'll spend some time going over these and a little bit how each kind of the pelvic floor kind of makes up two triangular shapes. Um, but you can see them here, how you kind of have one group of muscles around the anus, which makes up the anal triangle. And then the other group will make up what we call the urogenital triangle. And maybe it's a little easier to see that triangle. You can kind of see the triangle in both. So these muscles are the same in both, but a little different in how they're arranged, obviously. But these make up pelvic floor muscles. Um, if you've ever given birth, usually there's, um, you could go to see a physical therapist to try to strengthen your pelvic floor. Usually that's only a problem with women who have given birth, they have to worry about that. Um, but we'll work, we'll go through those muscles in lab too. Muscles of your hips and thighs, iliopsoas flexes your hip. 
And flexion of the hip means kind of movement. Remember, anytime you hear the word flexion, that means decreasing an angle. So if you flex your hip, it's kind of like touching your toes. If you're sitting down, that's flexing your hip. Uh, the gluteus maximus is your buttocks. You have a gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. Your glute muscles help to abduct your thigh and extend your hip. Extension of your hip, remember extension means um, widening an angle. So if you extend your hip, you're like pulling your leg back from this kind of, if you're standing, you're pulling your leg back. And then abducting your thigh would be lifting your thigh away. And then adducting would be bringing it back. Quadriceps muscles are on the anterior side of your leg. You have four thigh muscles, the rectus femoris. They will all, all your quadriceps help to extend your knee. And extension of the knee means to like kick your leg out if you were kicking a soccer ball. That's extending your knee. Um, so the rectus femoris is the straight one because it has the rectus name. And then you have a vastus lateralis and medialis on either side with the vastus intermedius kind of right below your rectus femoris. Um, and again, you'll spend, well, you should spend three hours in lab today studying these and reviewing them as well. So it'll make more sense when you see them again in lab. The gracilis mu muscle adducts the thigh and flexes your knee. Flexion of the knee means, um, you, again, you're reducing the angle of your knee. So that means to like kick your knee up as if you're trying to kick your butt, like butt kicks in soccer practice. That's the only way I can describe flexion of the knee. You're kind of lifting your knee back up. The biceps femoris, semimembranosus, and semitendinosus, these are your hamstring groups. So these are on the back of the thigh. They will also help to flex the knee. So kicking your foot up, um, rotating the leg and extension of the hip. Um, all right, so here we have muscles of the hip and thigh. Their pictures are a little small and I think their lab will be a little bit easier to see them. But here are our quadriceps femoris group, the four muscles that make that up and the hamstring muscle group that makes up the posterior side of the leg. So again, your quadriceps muscles all will help to extend your knee as if you're kicking out a soccer ball and your hamstring muscles group help to flex your knee as if you're trying to lift your um, foot up and um, flexing your knee back. Um, you can see here the rectus femoris right down the middle and then the vastus lateralis and medialis on either side with the vastus intermedius being deep. You see your gluteus maximus and medius muscles. You have a minimus muscle that is below those and then the hamstring muscles on the back, the biceps femoris is always the lateral kind of side. And the other two, the semitendinosus and membranosus sit right on top of each other. Muscles of the lower leg, your tibialis anterior follows alongside your tibia bone. It inverts the foot, so move your feet to kind of do pointed toes inward. The gastric nemius and your soleus are both calf muscles. They will both flex the foot um, and leg. So flexion of the foot would be to like um, plant your foot down to try to stand up on your tiptoes. That would be flexing of the foot. And those are your lower leg muscles. And again, these pictures are a little small. We will look through these in lab um, today and you can always review those in lab a little bit better too. Okay, so we're gonna jump right in now. If you're still with me, I'm gonna start chapter eight and there's two parts to chapter eight. So I don't, I don't know why they give us only one day to get through them all because we could hardly get through probably them both in two days, but chapter eight will be a big chapter on the nervous system. And we'll try to get through as much as part one as we can today, um, but these nervous system, I don't know why students, some students love the nervous system, but it is a lot of kind of, um, it's a lot of material that you can't see because you're focused on cells of the brain and spinal cord um, that are just really hard to see even under a microscope. So because of that, the nervous system can be a little tricky, but we'll try to keep it light and fun. So your nervous system itself, um, and again, you guys are in the introductory anatomy course. I would encourage you to go on and take anatomy 150, 151, um, just because then you'll dive into this a little bit more. And every time you see this material another time, you're going to be like, oh yeah, I remember that from the first time seeing it. So I would encourage you all to take those future classes if you can as well. So your nervous system, we divide into kind of two sections, the central nervous system, CNS, 
is your brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, the PNS, are all the nerves to your face, the ganglia, which are kind of clusters of nerve cell bodies, nerves to your upper limb, and nerves to your lower limb. So those are kind of the two um, structural divisions of your nervous system, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. Your nervous system is a really interesting system because it pretty much controls all of your body's processes. It receives sensory input from the external and internal environment. So your nervous system constantly needs to be knowing what's going on around your body and what's going on inside your body. It will integrate that information and in the integration center, usually that is, is your brain or your spinal cord, which is receiving all this sensory information and then it will send out some sort of response to control all your muscles, all your glands. It maintains homeostasis, and that includes everything. That includes cellular metabolism. That includes blood glucose levels, pH levels, body temperature regulation. And your nervous system establishes and maintains all of your mental activity. So memories, um, smell, vision, sight. So there's just a lot to get through in the nervous system, but it is very interesting. We divide your um, nervous system into your central nervous system, that's your brain and spinal cord, and your peripheral nervous system, which is all nervous tissue outside of that. We can also divide your nervous system into the sensory division, which will conduct an action potential. And remember from our talk about muscles, an action potential is just some sort of nervous stimulus or signal that we're trying to pass down. So those action potentials will come from a sensory receptor, whether that's in your skin or your eyes or your nose or your ears to help you sense all those different senses. And it will conduct those impulses to your central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord, where your brain figures out what's going on around you. And then the motor division of your nervous system will conduct action potentials out to all of the effector organs and muscles and glands to elicit some sort of response that it needs to take. We also divide your nervous system into a somatic or an autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system transmits action potentials from your brain to skeletal muscles. So if it helps you remember, somatic starts with an S, and skeletal muscle starts with an S. So your somatic nervous system helps to control your skeletal muscles. And your autonomic nervous system transmits action potentials from the brain to all of your cardiac muscle tissue. So your heart, your smooth muscle tissue, and all of your glands. So autonomic, you hear the word automatic in there. So the autonomic nervous system these are things that happen automatically, subconsciously. So without you knowing it, your brain right now is controlling your heart rate. It's controlling your digestive tract functions. If you just ate breakfast, you're not telling your digestive tract to digest your food. Your brain is controlling that as well as your glands. So when you salivate, when you get hungry or saliva starts to pour out of your mouth because you're eating a juicy hamburger, that is all happening automatically. You're not telling that to happen. And then the enteric nervous system is a special nervous system found only in your digestive tract. So here's how we organize your nervous system. Um, we have all, if we start with kind of sensory input, and this can be all input either from your external or your internal environment. You have light, sound, taste, smell, touch, temperature, brain, pain, pressure. That always gets inputted to the brain through sensory receptors and through the sensory division. Then your central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, will integrate and process all that information that it received and then send out some sort of motor response. And you can see here the peripheral nervous system consists all of, you know, all the nervous tissue that's outside of your brain and spinal cord. The sensory division is kind of easy to you know, talk about the motor division is where we have a lot of different kind of pathways to control the different parts of your body. The somatic nervous system, remember, controls skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system, these are things that happen automatically. 
we divide your autonomic nervous system into a sympathetic and a parasympathetic division. And we'll talk about what each of those mean, but what they both will control are all processes that happen automatically or autonomically in your body. So your cardiac, your smooth muscle control, your glands, and we combine all of this, you know, whether you're controlling your skeletal muscles or your heart rate or your breathing rate or your metabolism, that's all a motor output because it's all a response that's coming from your brain because of a signal, some sort of sensory input that it received. Specialized cells of the nervous system, we have neurons, which will receive stimuli, which is the signal, conduct an action potential, and then transmit the signal to other neurons or an effector organ. And then we have glial cells, which are all of our supportive cells of the central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system meaning that these cells will not conduct action potentials. All they do is they support the neurons. They carry out specific functions that we'll talk about, but all they do is they try to enhance normal neuronal function to maintain normal conditions within nervous tissue. If you have a glioblastoma, that's a tumor, a brain tumor um, of your glial cells. So most tumors in the brain are formed from abnormal growth or activity of glial cells. Glial cells are much more common in your nervous system than the neurons itself. Let's first talk about a neuron. Um, a neuron, a nerve cell, has a cell body with one nucleus. It has dendrites, which are kind of cytoplasmic extensions from the cell body that will receive information from other neurons and then transmit the information to the cell body. And then the axon is a single long cell process that leaves the cell body at the axon hillock and conducts sensory signals to your central nervous system and motor signals away from your central nervous system. So here's a picture of a typical neuron. And as you see here, you can see the neuron cell body with the nucleus. And you see a lot of similar organelles that you would find in other cells. You have rough endoplasmic reticulum, a Golgi mitochondria. Um, these are the dendrites, which are extensions from the cell body. The dendrites will receive signals from other neurons, pass those signals to the cell body where those signals will be processed. And then the axon is the one single extension that comes off of the cell body that will carry the action potential or the signal down a neuron to connect with another neuron to continue passing that signal down. You usually have one single axon coming off the cell body, but your axon will eventually branch into hundreds or thousands of tiny branches at the end as it's going to innervate different parts, different cells, different muscles, or other neurons. Um, the axon hillock is this area, and that's the area that kind of connects your axon to your cell body. And that usually is where an action potential gets started. You have Schwann cells, which create what we call myelin sheaths, which are kind of layers of electrical tape that surround the axons. Um, to try to help the signal to pass a little bit quicker. You might see a collateral axon, kind of a branch coming off of an axon, but for the most part, you see one single axon coming off of the neuron itself. A multipolar neuron has many dendrites and a single axon. And that's, this, is a this is a multipolar neuron, which you're seeing here. Um, most of the neurons within your CNS are nearly all multipolar and are all motor neurons. If you have a bipolar neuron, that means it just has two processes, one dendrite and one axon. And bipolar neurons are really common in some sensory organs, especially as like the retina of your eye, the photoreceptors, we'll talk about those, as, as well as in the nasal cavity. And then the other structure you can have is a sooty unipolar neuron that has just one single process which extends from the cell body and divides into two processes as short as a short distance from the cell body. One process extends to the periphery and the other extends to your central nervous system. And the two extensions will function as a single axon with small dendrite-like sensory receptors at the periphery. And those are much more rare, you could say. So the multipolar neuron 
This is kind of your typical neuron that's the most common, which we talked about many dendrites, a cell body and one axon. The bipolar neuron just has one dendrite and one axon, and this is what we'll find in your eye and in your nose, in some of your sensory organs. And then the sooty unipolar neuron looks like it's, you kind of have where the axon branches will function as a single axon and the cell body is pushed off to the side. So then our glial cells. So our glial cells are our supportive cells in the peripheral and central nervous system. And we have different types of glial cells. We have astrocytes, which serve as the main supporting cells in your brain and spinal cord. That's your CNS. What astrocytes will do is they will stimulate or inhibit the signaling activity of a nearby neuron, neuron and form what we call the blood-brain barrier. And I'll talk about what that is when we get to a picture. Um, ependymal cells, so I'm just gonna number these. Astrocytes is number one. Ependymal sites is number two. Ependymal cells line your cavities in your brain that contain cerebral spinal fluid. Microglial cells act in an immune function in your central nervous system by removing bacteria and cellular debris. And then oligodendrocytes provide myelin to the neurons in your central nervous system. And up until this point, those first four are only found in your central nervous system. The Schwann cell, I'm just gonna also number it number four because the Schwann cell is found in the peripheral nervous system, but it does the same thing as an oligodendrocyte. It will provide myelin to neurons. And remember, myelin is what will insulate the axons to help the nervous impulse or the action potential travel more quickly down the axon. So here are our type of glial cells. Here are astrocytes forming what we call the blood-brain barrier. And it forms a barrier between the brain tissue and the blood. So astrocytes, you can see in this picture, they have little feet processes that kind of wrap themselves around your capillaries to allow harmful substances that could be in the, the blood from reach, kind of reaching out into brain tissue. There's a couple things that can get through this blood-brain barrier. Alcohol, nicotine, and some drugs can still get through this barrier produced by your astrocytes. Ependymal cells, this was kind of our glial cell number two. And again, the, these first four are only found in your central nervous system. Ependymal cells line the cavities of your brain. So inside your brain, you have holes or spaces. The ependymal cells line them they're lined with cilia to help circulate and move cerebral spinal fluid. And we'll talk about what that is. Here's a microglial cell, which is a type of immune cell that gets rid of excess debris um, or anything foreign that could have entered the brain. Sorry, I'm just muting myself while I'm taking a sip of water. And then we have the oligodendrocyte which in the central nervous system produces the myelin that it acts as electrical tape to cover up axons. And the Schwann cell is the, the um, glial cell in your peripheral nervous system that produces myelin to surround your axons. So I'm just gonna write PNS next to Schwann cell because all of these other four are found in your central nervous system. So what exactly is myelin? Myelin sheaths are specialized layers that wrap around axons um, of some neurons. And if a neuron has myelin, we call it myelinated. And the sheaths are formed by oligodendrocytes if we're in the brain and spinal cord and Schwann cells if we're in the peripheral nervous system. And myelin just acts as an insulator to help prevent ion movement across the cell membrane um, so that the action potential kind of jumps between myelin sheaths, and that's what makes the action potential very fast in a myelinated neuron. Where you have a gap in the myelin sheaths, we call that the nodes of Ranvier, and the, where ion movement can occur are at these nodes where there's a gap, and myelination of an action potential will increase the speed and efficiency generated along the action potential because the action potential jumps kind of between these myelin sheaths in the nodes of Ranvier where ions can move in and out.
Because remember, the movement of ions is what causes depolarization, repolarization, and an action potential. Some of you might have heard of multiple sclerosis before. For some reason, it affects women as early as their 30s. Multiple sclerosis, there's no cure for it, just managing treatments. It's a disease of the myelin sheath that causes loss of muscle function. So if we don't have myelin, we're not kind of getting a very quick response to muscle function. So usually you, you lose muscle function very slowly in multiple sclerosis. Um, if a axon does not have myelin, we call it unmyelinated. And these axons will rest in the indentations of oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells. And a typical small nerve, which consists of axons of multiple neurons, some of those axons might contain um, unmyelinated axons and myelinated axons. And usually there are more unmyelinated ones. So here we just have myelination, an unmyelinated and a myelinated axon. So here's an axon that's covered with those myelin sheaths created by Schwann cells. So we must be in the peripheral nervous system. And an unmyelinated axon, you can see there are Schwann cells present, but you can see that the axons aren't completely covered by myelin. The Schwann cells are just there, but they're not actually creating these rings of myelin sheaths to surround those axons. So the organization of nervous tissue, we can organize it based on the color. And the color is due to whether we have myelinated axons or not. And that is because um, myelin is white. So white matter, and it looks white underneath the microscope, consists of bundles of parallel axons with their myelin sheaths because myelin is white. And gray matter consists of groups of more neuron cell bodies and their dendrites where there's very little myelin. So we organize nervous tissue in the brain, the spinal cord, whether it's gray or white. And just remember that white is usually axons, myelinated, and gray matter is more the cell bodies and the dendrites because those will never be covered in myelin. And now we'll talk a little bit about action potentials and how signals are passed through your neurons. And this will be a little bit of a review and it will hopefully make a little sense because we talked a little bit about it with muscle tissue already. But resting memory potentials, which means a neuron is at rest and an action potential will occur in a neuron. And these potentials are mainly due to differences in concentrations of ions across the membrane, whether they're inside the cell or outside the cell. We also use membrane channels and sodium potassium pumps to control these concentrations of ions. A leak channel, for example, is always open, whereas a gated channel are generally closed, but they can be opened due to a change in voltage or a chemical. Leak channels are always open and ions can leak or leave kind of move across the membrane down their concentration gradients. And because there, there are 50 to 100 times more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels, the resting membrane potential has a much greater permeability to potassium than to sodium. So the potassium leak channels um, kind of are the greatest con contributor to the resting membrane potential. So if maintaining kind of the electrical charge across the membrane at rest is due to these potassium leak channels. Gated channels have a gate on them, so they will be closed until they're opened by a signal. They, you could have a chemically gated channel, which is opened by a chemical or a neurotransmitter when it's bound to it, or a voltage gated channel when it's, when, and it, it will be opened by a change in memory potential or electrical charge. And when these gated channels are opened, the gated channels can change membrane potential, and then those are responsible for the action potential. So leak channels are responsible for resting membrane potential, but um, gated channels are responsible for the action potential. The sodium potassium pump will compensate for the constant leakage through the leak channels. We kind of have this extra pump system um, that's required to always maintain 
sodium ions to be outside the cell membrane and potassium ions to be inside the cell membrane. So this pump constantly and actively transports potassium into the cell and sodium out of the cell. And it's estimated that the sodium potassium pump consumes about 25% of all of your ATP in a typical cell and about 70% of all the ATP in a neuron. And that's just good to remember because um, creating ATP is, a, is an important part of cellular metabolism. And most of the ATP that your body needs is going to kind of basically give energy to the sodium potassium pump because it's so important to make sure that these concentrations of sodium outside and potassium inside are always correct. So then we get to your resting membrane potential. So at rest, we have a potential or a charge difference at the membrane of your neuron. And this exists because potassium ions, there's more potassium on the inside of the cell membrane, and there's more sodium ions on the outside of the cell membrane. There's other negatively charged molecules like very large proteins that always remain inside the cell because they're too large to exit. And those proteins have a negative charge to them so that the inside of the cell at resting is always very negative. The presence of the leak protein channels in the membrane um, is always more permeable to potassium than to sodium. At resting, um, because sodium is more concentrated outside of the cell, it will always want to diffuse into the cell. And because potassium is more concentrated inside the cell, it will always want to diffuse or leave the cell. In order to maintain the resting membrane, this is where our sodium and potassium pump, it's constantly recreating those concentration gradients so that there's always more sodium outside of the cell and always more potassium into the cell. If you remember anything today, just remember that at resting, so when your neurons are at rest, before they fire off an action potential, there's always more sodium outside the cell and always more potassium inside the cell. Um, so try to remember that. And then this is going to be a little review of what we went through with muscles, but at resting, you know, you can see leak channels, but you can see that potassium channels are more permeable. So Potassium channels will be the ones that are leaking out. Excess potassium ions, you see proteins with a big negative charge to them. In general, you see this concentration being established with the pink sodium ions, and it's flowing down into the cell because sodium is always more concentrated outside of the cell. So it's concentration gradient and will naturally want to flow into the cell. Potassium is more concentrated inside the cell, so its concentration gradient will have an arrow going up because potassium will naturally want to flow out of the cell down its concentration gradient. Here is showing the leakage channels. There's many more potassium leakage channels than sodium, so potassium will leak out um, to help to establish the resting membrane potential, but the sodium potassium pump will constantly be, work being working, be working to establish more or pump more sodium ions out of the cell and more potassium back into the cell because having those concentrations is, will be very important when we establish an action potential. So here we have the membrane potential and the sodium potassium pump is shown here. Um, what it does is it um, pumps three sodium out. So that's why you see three pink circles moving out of the cell and it pumps two um, potassium ions into the cell. And it does that at the same time, and it always requires ATP, so that's an active transport mechanism. So then what is an action potential? An action potential will allow conductivity along the nerve or the muscle membrane. So we already talked about this in muscles already. It's very similar to electricity going through a wire. Think of electricity, sent through a wire, that's like an action potential being sent through our nerves. And the channels responsible for an action potential are voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, which will be closed at rest, but they will open when a stimulus is applied, usually following 
a neurotransmitter activation of the chemical gated channel, sodium channels will open briefly and sodium will diffuse quickly into the cell. And that's kind of the first step of an action potential. The movement of sodium into the cell causes the cell membrane to become positive and we call that depolarization because as sodium moves into the cell, it brings its positive charge with it. So that causes depolarization. If depolarization is not strong enough, sodium channels will close again. And what we call a local potential will disappear without actually being kind of fired off down the axon as an action potential. But if we have depolarization get large enough, sodium will enter the cell so that the local potential reaches what we call a threshold value. And this kind of threshold value, once that is reached, that causes all the voltage-gated sodium channels to open, usually at the axon hillock region, meaning that at that part, it will, we've now established an action potential that can travel down the axon. The opening of these channels will cause a massive 600-fold increase in membrane permeability, meaning that sodium just is just rushing into that axon as that axon is being fired or elect electrically stimulated with this action potential. Um, potassium channels start to open, and that'll be our next step. But as more sodium enters the cell, depolarization continues at a much faster pace causing a brief reversal of charge, which brings the inside of the cell membrane to become positive. And this charge reversal, once it becomes positive, will then close your sodium channels and sodium stops entering the cell because we've reached our action potential. After this time, or kind of towards the end, potassium channels open and potassium, we know, naturally wants to leave the cell. And when it leaves, potassium will take its positive charge with it the inside of the cell becomes more negative again, and we call that repolarization when potassium leaves the cell. And I know this is a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna just talk for a couple more minutes and then we'll pause here. But at the end of repolarization, pretty much at the end of an action potential, the charge on the cell membrane becomes even more negative than it should be. And this condition is called hyperpolarization and occurs very briefly. And action potentials occur in what we call an all or none fashion, meaning if we reach that threshold value, if enough sodium channels open, an action potential will occur like an all or none response. And if we don't reach that threshold value, no action potential occurs at all. The sodium potassium pump is again, always kind of the worker that will assist in restoring the resting membrane potential and reestablishing those concentrations so that there's always more sodium outside and more potassium inside. So here we kind of have a summary of action potential. We have resting membrane potential at about negative 70 millivolts. So the inside of your neurons at rest is at resting. If we get a local potential established and it doesn't reach threshold yet, we won't kind of fire off an action potential. But if we reach this threshold value, which is about negative 55, then we'll get this depolarization kind of upswing as sodium ions rush into your neurons. That itself is the action potential peak. Repolarization occurs when potassium leaves your cell and brings the inside of the cell back to negative, this hyperpolarization state means that kind of too many potassiums have left, which means that the inside of the cell becomes too negative. And at this hyperpolarization state, um, another action potential can't be generated at this time, um, but the sodium potassium pump will get us back up to resting so that that neuron can fire off again. So here are the steps of the action potential. And I really like the next three slides because they show you which channels open and where it is on the graph and how we kind of reach this action potential peak. So at resting membrane potential, all the voltage gated channels are closed and we have more sodium outside of the cell and more potassium ions inside of the cell. This is at resting where the voltage of your cell membrane is about negative 70 millivolts right now. 
let's say we get some sort of stimulus that could be um, a light source shine into your eyes. It could be my voice talking. Anytime your nerves are responding to a stimulus, they fire off an action potential. And the first step is depolarization. And depolarization occurs when sodium channels open and sodium rushes into the cell. When sodium brings the positive charge into the cell, we get to have our more positive action potential peak. Repolarization is when potassium channels open and potassium flows out of the cell down its concentration gradient. Potassium brings its positive charge with it so that the inside of the cell becomes more negative again, and we even get to the hyperpolarization state. The action potential in general are conducted more slowly in an unmyelinated axon. Um, action potentials along unmyelinated axons have to occur along the entire membrane, but an action potential along a myelinated axon can jump between those nodes of Ranvier and we call that saltatory conduction. And because it can jump, kind of skip segments of the axon, it can go much more quickly. And this is showing how the unmyelinated axon conducts an action potential. You can see here how the outside of the membrane becomes negative, the inside becomes positive, that's depolarization, as the action potential travels down the axon itself. In the myelinated axon conduction, this is called saltatory conduction. You can see here how the action potential is moving down the axon, but because we have these myelin sheaths, which insulate the neuron, the action potential kind of has to jump between nodes. So when it jumps, it's skipping parts of the axon. So it's just able to go more quickly. So in general, the speed of an action potential um, Conduction varies widely, uh, even among myelinated axons, because it's based on your diameter of your axon fibers. Really simply put, you could have a medium diameter, lightly myelinated axon, which conducts action potentials at about three to 15 meters per second. But if you have a very large diameter, heavily myelinated axon, it can conduct action potentials at the rate of 15 to 120 meters per second, which is very fast. A synapse then, and I think I'll stop there. We'll stop at synapse. We just have about 10 slides to get left through, but what we'll do is we'll stop at synapse because I think you have enough to kind of focus in on with the action potential for a neuron. And on Wednesday, we'll finish up uh, the part one of chapter eight, and we'll try to finish up part two of chapter eight to get through the nervous system um, this week. So I'll stop the recording.